Hey, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, short stuff, I should say. I'm Josh. There's Chuck. There's Jerry. Let's get to it. <laughs> and they're off <laughs> with another shorty. So, um, I we're about to talk about something I had no idea about previous to this. Yeah, and this one has a couple of layers that are super interesting to me. It is it is an onion for sure. Yeah. Um, so we're 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 gonna dive into the history of a guy named William Rufus Devane King. And he was an early uh, senator. Mm -hmm. He was a diplomat for the United States. Um, Well, I think he was a congressman first. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then he was a diplomat. And Mm -hmm. then he was a senator for like 29 years or something like that. And then eventually he became vice president. And the way that he apparently progressed through the ranks in the Democratic Party was by being... Pretty middle of the road, vanilla, mediocre. Yeah, and I, I interpreted that as also he was a a good guy that you know he wasn't one of these blustery blowhards mm-hmm. of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, he was an attorney first, of course, probably like most of these uh, dudes were and still are. Right, and he he was described as various things: uh, tall, prim, wig topped mediocrity, but other things that they said were like he. He wanted people to address each other with decorum, and whenever people were arguing, he was known to come in and kind of try and reconcile things. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like this guy's style the more I read about him. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. You I I think to be middle of the road at this time was actually kind of um, uh, a badge of honor. Oh, interesting. I mean, this is during the the lead up to the Civil War, so the country is not getting along very well, right? Yeah. So he um, he started out again in Congress, uh, and then he went on to serve as diplomat to Russia and then Naples, the Kingdom of Naples, no less. Yeah, and in France at one point too, I think. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. And then by 1818, he returned to the U.S. and he said, "I'm going to find my fortunes way out west." So he went to Alabama, <laughs> which was way out west at the time. Yeah. And he was he was born the son of a plantation owner and he became a plantation owner there. He owned 500 slaves, um became one of the the largest slaveholders in this um newly formed state and he named his estate Chestnut Hill. And and from there that's where he became the the senator for 29 years. He was a senator from Alabama for 29 years. Um and actually was instrumental in um ironically naming the town of Selma. Oh. Wow. Did you see that? No. So there was a, a, a poem, a book of poems about called like Songs of Selma um, that he was, uh, that he loved. And when they were naming the county seat of the county where his, his plantation was, he was basically instrumental in getting it named Selma, the city of Selma, Alabama. Yeah. So he would eventually go on uh, through the G- uh, Democratic Party at the time to be vice president. President to be a presidential running mate to um, hopeful Franklin Pierce, mm-hmm. uh, and this is things where things get a little bit interesting because many historians, and it says some, but I did some research on this, and most historians now look back and say President James Buchanan was clearly a gay man, right? And it's interesting to think about our past being a little more open to that. Mm-hmm. But there's a guy uh, that wrote a book, uh, Jim Lowen, called um, Lies, Teachers, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Teacher Got Wrong. And he, he clearly states that, that James Buchanan was gay. And not only that, it was not a big secret. And America was actually a little – more open to that kind of thing and permissive of that kind of thing back then. Right, right. It wasn't like like his career, his political career wasn't ruined. It wasn't like blackmail held against him. And th- that just so goes against what most people think of with history, that it's like a, a arrow that progresses ever forward. And that by by default then, like the time we live in must be more tolerant, more progressive than you know, a hundred something years ago, 150 years ago. And that's just not the case. And this is a good example of that. Yeah. So he calls it, this author says that the idea that we started great and just got greater and greater Mm -hmm. uh, chronological ethnocentrism, Mm -hmm. which is a fancy way of saying what you just said, which is in the 19th century, it was okay, at least to, you know, him. he got elected president. 
Uh, yeah, and speaking of fancy, one of the, the um, examples that they point to is that this was an open secret or just known around D.C. is that Andrew Jackson um, had a nickname for James Buchanan and uh, William King, Miss Nancy and Aunt Fancy. Yeah, because here's the deal. Uh, Buchanan never married. He and King lived together and spent a lot of time together. And that was basically sort of known around town that that was the deal. Uh, when Buchanan died, mm -hmm. he had all of his correspondences burned upon his death, right. which is sort of a weird thing to do. But a few of the letters did survive, and one of them uh, from 1844 addressed to a Mrs. Roosevelt said uh, when King moved to Paris to be ambassador to France, he said, I am now solitary and alone, having no companion in the house with me. I have gone wooing to several gentlemen, but have not succeeded with any of them. Tough to take that the wrong way. It is. I mean, of course, we're saying, you know, it's pretty clear now, but, you know, who knows? They may make the argument in this article it could have just been close male friends. But I think most people kind of agree now that James Buchanan was our, our first gay president. Yeah, which is pretty awesome, actually. Yeah, of course. Um, and then that same letter, Chuck, that you just read a quote from goes on to say that um, if this keeps up, he may very well just marry an old maid who can cook and care for him and won't expect ardent romance from him Yeah, in return. So, yeah, there's just the evidence is that what little evidence there is certainly points to this. And and. The, I, the idea that, it, uh, as this article puts it, that this is just like a bromance or something. Yeah. And that seems pretty thin. All signs point to him being gay. But also in defense of this article uh, on how stuff works, they say that um, that hit, that had zero bearing whatsoever on his political aptitude. Um, it was just an interesting fact of history that kind of makes us examine our own times a little more. Yeah, and I'll tell you one thing. Um I don't know much about the 19th century, uh, but I do know that gay men existed and bromances did not. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know? Yeah. That's a stupid modern conceit. Yeah. And I think what you just said is a t-shirt, too. A long t-shirt. <laughs> Maybe front and back. But... A sleep shirt. <laughs> there you go. All right. So we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back to uh, let you know why we titled this one, um, How King Actually Took His Oath of Office in Cuba, right after this. <laughs> So, so William King, I want to call him Rufus King so bad because it's William Rufus Devane King, but yeah. that's not, not what he was called, Josh. Not what he was called. <laughs> but uh, William King uh, had another claim to fame historically in that he was the only person in the United States history elected to high office um, who was sworn in off of U.S. soil. Yeah. And that was um, the way that it happened is, it's interesting, but it's not anything that William King wanted. No, he got tuberculosis, uh, got very sick. And from the time of his uh, election in November 1852 as Pierce's vice president to when he would eventually take office in March of 1853, this was sort of the time when they were like, um, go to a good, hot, warm climate because that will, will help you out, which is, you know, it probably does help along, but it's not a cure-all, you know. Yeah, the muggy air of Cuba will really clear out your tuberculosis. <laughs> it doesn't. That doesn't seem. It doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, know? that's true. I didn't think about the humidity. But that's where he went. He went down to Havana to to restore his health f between the election and the swearing in. But his health just got worse and worse and worse. And by the time he was to be sworn in, within like a week or so. I think maybe even more than that, because he wouldn't have been able to make it from Havana to D.C. within a week at that time. On a boat? Yeah. Um, but within that time, he realized, like, I'm not going to be able to make it to D.C. I'm still too sick. Yeah. Uh, the time is too short. I'm just going to have to ask if I can be sworn in down here. And Congress said, you know what? We like you, Will. We think you're great. We give you uh, a, lot of, a lot of BS about you and Buchanan, but we think you're a pretty great person. So... Yeah, we're going to pass an act of Congress to make that happen. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. They passed this legislation uh, allowing him to be sworn in in Cuba. And on March 24th, 1853, he did just that at an office near uh, Matanzas. Mm -hmm. Matanzas? 
Matanzas. That has a little more flair. Yeah. Uh, and this is a seaport town about 60 miles east of Havana. He was so sick he couldn't even stand up without help. But he repeated the oath. He became our 13th vice president, uh, which is pretty remarkable on Cuban soil. And then after about a month, he was like, I really would kind of like to get back to the U.S., set sail for Alabama. Yeah, yeah. And imagine this, Chuck. Can't you see like a Cuban sea captain go, you want to go to Alabama? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like your Cuban sea captain. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> I've been working on it all day. Uh, oh, is that why you're wearing that shirt? Uh-huh. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> now it all makes sense. <laughs> so he set sail, and uh, eventually he would die April 18th, the day after he got back to United States soil. Yeah, he, he made it back to Chestnut Hill and expired post-haste. Yeah, and here's something I didn't know. Apparently, you didn't really need a vice president back then because <laughs> we went four years without one. Well, I don't know if you didn't need one or not, but Franklin Pierce is, in my opinion, the worst president the United States has ever had. Uh-huh. He and um, King were elected because they were so middle of the road and so vanilla and so plain on the, especially on like the slavery issue, that that they were elected to try to keep the U.S. from the Civil War. But they, well, not not uh, King, but definitely Pierce laid the groundwork for it. Yes, yeah. almost single handedly with this terrible administration. So um, he, Franklin Pierce, is terrible. Nice. And I could see him being like, I don't need a vice president. I can screw it all up myself. I like that. I didn't know about your longstanding Franklin Pierce grudge. It, yeah, it's it's hot. <laughs> you got anything else? No, that's it. Well, thanks for hanging out with us for this brief time. <laughs> yeah. For you, while you made it through your bag of carrot sticks on your lunch break. <laughs> um, if you want to hang out with us, go to our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com, and look us up. I'm also at areyouseriousclark.com, and we're all over social media. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Bye. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 